we could just kind of like bullshit um for a little while before um you know whatever we talk about it i mean hopefully you enjoyed it hopefully it was oh yeah i did i did i mean um i enjoyed it more than the uh in another country yeah yeah that was i was gonna have you read 10 indians after that which is honestly just as bad as in another country (laughs) you thought it was bad really (laughs) i thought it was like I wasn't sure about it. I was like, uh, it kind of felt like one of those stories that we all kind of, or, you know, poems or stories that we write and it's just like kind of flat, you know, not a lot right. of juice there's, to it. There's no plot. That's the problem with both stories. There's mm-hmm. no, like time doesn't really move per se. In another country, it's, uh, it is moving, but the, the thing that changes, changes off the page. And you don't get to see, like, that's, I think, in some respects, that's what makes literature as fun to read as it is, is when you get to see the person change, when you get to see the thing happening inside of them. And um, you see the metamorphosis, like, just that act alone is um, inherently interesting to, to people to read, especially when it's happening authentically. Because when you capture it well enough, the reader, as they're reading it, starts to change a little bit. Especially if you can get the change to happen on an emotional level, which I think it does in The Undefeated. Um, and it does yeah. in another country, you know? <laughs> just like this guy's just a prick. <laughs> and, uh, you know, you realize, he comes to realize, because you know, they have this discussion about wives, that uh, his wife died. And... Mm-hmm. Um, and the guy leaves and he comes back and he's just as jaded but he's uh, he explains himself to the narrator and the narrator comes to understand some of his humanity it's, it's almost like a bad soap opera <laughs> you know I mean yeah. that's why nobody talks about that short story it's, just, it's, it's the like, same thing enunciate with... enunciate and he finally it's like yeah. oh, I tried to enunciate so he didn't he, hate me he was a cool <laughs> character and it's a cool setting for a story to happen you're at this hospital where um, oh, everybody's performed you know, and there's a hierarchy be- between the guys as they're, um, as they're realizing where their wounds come from. Mm-hmm. He's at the bottom of it. So I mean, it, you know, Hemingway's still doing hallmarks of what a great storyteller is supposed to do, but there's no, there's no great climax. You know, the climax yeah. happens off the page, and that's all. Like Hemingway wasn't Alice Monroe. You know, he wasn't somebody who. You know, he writes a short story and you sit around wondering, you know, <laughs> what happened? What happened between here and here? It's not yeah. the kind of writer he was. He was the kind of writer like, I'm just going to show you somebody um, going through the worst thing that ever happened to him. Which really, by the I, way, this, the undefeated made me realize that was Hemingway's forte. Hemingway was at his best. When he had a group of characters and he just made things get progressively worse and worse and worse and worse until he couldn't make them any more worse than they were. Mm-hmm. And finally somebody collapses, you know, and somebody somebody comes to terms with their own uh mortality. I didn't read um like Hills Like White Elephants right before this, but I've read it about a thousand times before. So it'd be kind of interesting to compare the two different types of stories, one with a lot of movement. A lot of scene and one with like a really short scene and just some dialogue, you know. Uh, yeah, but uh, I guess I I've, I've been teaching that short story every uh, every semester. Oh, yeah, I, I, I did, did I, too um, because it was in my book, so I was like, "Fuck, I'm gonna teach the hell out of this." <laughs> it's great because you finally confront the students with a with a real uncomfortable reality, which is, you know, can a relationship ever be the same before, or, or I'm saying, can a relationship ever be the same after an abortion? Can it ever be the same after discussion of needing an abortion? <laughs> you know, like mm-hmm. when does the, when does the relationship start to deteriorate? You know, um, and 
I mean, me and you can go down a line of people we've known who've gotten them and oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, gotten gotten uh, broken up with their spouse over it. You know, Leal broke up with uh, Dan. Um, Jen, you know, left Alex. Uh, it's just, it's something inherently true that Hemingway was able to touch on because he'd gone through it, you know, and he'd yeah. seen people go through it, and he knew he knew these two. Um, um, and his sympathies were with the the woman, also, which for me makes it more interesting. She's the more complex character. The man just wants to his life to be, you know, what it was before. I want to drink and travel and party, and I want to be free yeah. and unencumbered. And she's like, she poses this um hypothesis to him you know if we do this thing uh we'll never be the same we'll be like everybody else they'll have taken the world from us anyways yeah i mean love that damn story man it's, so it's great you know and it all right it is from, way, a, and from a female yeah. perspective which is like whenever anybody says Hemingway is a massage well he might have been but that story kind of shows his uh how his uh, adherence to like truth, you know? Yeah. Um, he was a flawed man, but yeah. by the way, he had three sons. One of them um, became transgender. No, I'm sorry. He had four, three from um, one wife and the fourth from another. One of his sons became a woman uh, in her, in her sixties, by the way. What? <laughs> After <laughs> one of Hemingway's sons became a woman. I had no idea. In in her sixties, after siring four children, <laughs> well, that's wild. And Did one of his it, other sons kill himself as well? I don't know if they killed themselves, but I know that Jack, his firstborn son, was accused by either two or three of his daughters of being a child molester and of having molested um, his own children. So, I mean, there was, you know, it's it's a really strange... Some mental health uh, uh, shit going yeah. through that family tree, man. Really, really perverse, weird mental shit going on. And, I mean, Hemingway and his father, and I think his grandfather all committed suicide. I'm not sure about his grandfather. I know him and his father did. Uh, okay, maybe so, I had it backwards then. It was his dad. Yeah, it was definitely the dad. And as soon as he saw his, his like a, supposedly when he saw his dad at the funeral, he's like, "That's how he told his wife at the time. That's how I'm going to go." Mm. Um, but the undefeated, you know. Oh yeah, uh, I was going to ask I you, think... <laughs> what do you think? Why? What is? Why is the story so special, Craig? So let you go off again. <laughs> so there, in the pantheon of great Hemingway short stories. You got the hills like white elephants. You got the snows of Kilimanjaro. Yeah. You got the short happy life of Francis McComber. If you, you know, dig deeper, you got nobody ever dies. And you got, uh, um, an African, uh, and I think it's called, uh, an African tale you have, or an African story. And you also have, um, a clean, well-lighted place. I mean, oh, yeah. People talk about these short stories. Two-hearted, right? The two-hearted, the big two-hearted river. Um, people talk about these short stories a lot. I've never heard anyone talk about the undefeated, and it's a shame. I think it's one of his best. I read it again today. I don't know if. Um, yeah, me too. <laughs> I, I, I don't. I don't know it. if I agree with my initial read that it was his best. But it's damn near. It's it definitely belongs in its best. It's definitely yeah. light years beyond. It's a, um, in another country and ten Indians. You know, it's just light years. Mm -hmm. It's it's and I think a lot of it has to do with plot. You know, um, it's uh, letting, it's impressive how he wrote it. That's the thing that struck me the first time I read it uh, a few days ago. So you you can um, talk about that, got, I guess. Yeah, two little scenes in the beginning. Mm -hmm. And Manuel's trying to talk to his old, uh, the, the guy who runs the uh, bullfighting and is trying to get a job. And I think the guy's name is Ratina. Um, yeah. And or Ratana. Ratana. And 
the boss, you know, for a moment is willing to indulge him, remembers the old days. They probably they have some sort of history, but quickly just dismisses. It's almost like I was having flashbacks. I was like, oh, this is Chris from the old strip club days. He's just already started <laughs> ignoring me. You know, um, as soon as Manuel starts going off about how much he's worth and how good he is, Ratana just immediately dismisses him. Yeah. And Zorito does the same thing. The second scene when they're um, and, and in fact, it's not just Zorito. It's the uh, coffee the shop baristas yeah. are dismissing him. He's like in the people on the street are dismissing him. He doesn't see anybody that he remembers. You know, there's a lot. This is the story so much about stupid stubbornness. What is um, it? Yeah. Yeah, it kind of establishes that early on. So I was like kind of wondering like why start there. I mean, obviously we kind of know because it kind of it gives a background or not background, but uh, where Manuel is at in his life. A lot I think a lesser writer would have started right at the in the ring, you know, the bull, but right, but Hemingway's building um a kind, you know, he's you have to understand the story doesn't start in at high octane it can um but anyway it comes from a different generation where things were built slower and more methodical you know it's a you know i don't want to say a slow burn because there's only those two scenes before you're in the middle of the arena and shit's happening Mm -hmm. um and anyway is going off on all cylinders by the way you know he's jumping from manuel to cerrito to the other bullfighters to the critic in the crowd um <laughs> yeah to the bull itself and just descriptions of the bull yeah it's just pure you know, fire, it's almost man. it's it's almost dostoevskian in that sense dostoevsky was somebody who would very much establish a scene and jump from character to character to character to character you know and, mm-hmm. and be able to keep track of all of them all at the same time uh what Hemingway them- does is he has like a great situ- a scene situational awareness. Like one of the parts of that, like he's throwing descriptions in there. They're throwing um their s- seats or their uh, seat cushions seat into cushions, the yeah. and, into the into the arena the, right at the climax of the or the you know the climax of the bullfight. Yeah, and the, the he doesn't forget that they're there. Like he's describing Manuel yeah. running back at him and he's kicking these things and it's just yeah. like everything is just so real, like well realized. Um, yeah. In the well, scene. it's because he's he's seen it as he's writing it, you know. Right. So much of writing is knowing how to set things up, and that can be taught. But the the ability to just actually live through these moments again is something I think I really think you have to be born with, you know. Um, yeah, it's, it's not something that or can curse be really with, taught, you know? yeah. right? <laughs> you know, uh, I, I really feel like Hemingway, as much as we may have tried <laughs> and we live through these things yeah i mean well because you can so much writing you can teach you know so much because people the, the thing about being human is that you are constantly you know living through the past and living yeah. in your head so you're like kind of so, t- teach a mindset like what writing really is like you said seeing it so it sounds simple but it's not just seeing it it's breathing it's like smelling it you know and like being right. that person again or being, being that vulnerable. person for the first time you know being vulnerable enough to share them you know the things that you're haunted by is is something else that you know can be taught to an extent and it can't and then the other there's another extent that it cannot be taught you just have to be that vulnerable um but i one of the reasons was uh, that he started where he started was it also was able to establish that Manuel was not even growing up was not considered to be the best bullfighter in his family. It was right. his uh, brother I believe his name Pablo um, who was killed by a bull that was that is mounted in the office in which he's speaking. And right, he's just staring again, at this bull's yeah. head that his brother was killed by. So that's why he started where he started, because he's able to he's able to build character. You have to understand, like 
a lesser writer would have started in the ring, but a le- like if you start in the ring, you don't ever understand why Manuel, or you don't even have any hints as to why Manuel is doing what he's doing when yeah. he's too old to be bullfighting. He missed his prime. Everybody around him is telling him it's time to quit. It's time to stop. He just got out of the hospital. He's been injured. And even in his own family, he was never considered to be the best. And the best was killed by a bull. You know? <laughs> even the best. Um, yeah, even the best go down. <clears throat> yeah. Um, or the, the better, you the know, better. which is probably why he does it. He's probably uh, probably one of the reasons why he does it. He does it for his brother, I think. It's it's at least it's possible. Yeah. Or maybe he does it for his own. See the thing, the other great thing about him anyway is he doesn't tell you he gives you hints as to what the answer might be, but he doesn't tell you flat out. He lets you, you know, complete the story however you know you want to complete it. Did he did it did he do it for his own vanity? Did he do it because um there was nothing else for him to do, and there's just not a whole lot of opportunities in this world for men, you know, in their 30s to start their lives over. Or did he do it for his brother? Um, yeah. Or did he do it's it for the nation? Because he has nothing else. That's basically what it boils down to. He's not going to just start. He says it um, to his uh, picador. What's his name again? Um, Azula? Zerito. Zerito, yeah. And he's like, um, I'll take this dog, maybe. <laughs> All right. Yeah, Zorino. Um Zorino's basically like, dude, hang it up. You've you've lost it. Uh, you've never had it, <laughs> basically. And this okay. and, and this guy is like, and Manuel's like, oh well, I'm not gonna work a regular job. I'm not gonna, you know, I'm just gonna do it because yeah. I kind of have to. But I guess you're right. Like the the my new interpretation is kind of up to you based you off the facts it. laid out on the table. You can see the parallels between Hemingway and this guy also. You know, how many times in Hemingway's life did he want to just quit writing? You know, he's probably rich enough to stop. Um, yeah. And there's just something in him that just kept bringing him back. <laughs> bringing him back. Um, yeah. He probably wanted to start his life over. I know for a fact that he tried to teach and he just couldn't teach and write. Um, you know, and he divorced every wife he ever had except for his last. The only reason he didn't divorce her is because he killed himself. It's probably the ultimate divorce, you know, so there's a lot of failure. There's a lot of wanting to desire, you know, there's a lot of wanting to start over again in the back of Hemingway's mind while he's writing this also. But anyway, so he... Yeah, it's kind of what makes the story somewhat universal is the idea of, like, should you continue what you what you set your life to be you know like <laughs> I, was, I was thinking about writing you know like just should i you know i think about that all the time you know the story really resonated with me in that case in that kind of uh way but, well, i'm uh, reading it the whole way through because it's like you know like man everybody's just telling you just go find something else go find something else it's like i can't right. you know i can't and yeah. It's not even so much that people are telling me that as it's like um, trying to get something published and all the rejection letters and yeah, you know a, trying to a get a steady message. career out of this fucking thing and you know and you're working semester by semester or you're finding you're picking up jobs where you can yeah it's it's odd jobs of, so many stories of people from the MFA just doing like odd shit kind of like what I'm doing what you did for a while with like hard labor and. Anybody with experience teaching knows fucking... how um, inconsistent and unreliable that is as a lifestyle, unless, you know, you were lucky enough. I don't know. Like, I don't want to, like, <laughs> cast shade on anybody, but I feel like it was a little different 30, 25, 30 years ago when you got an MFA, you probably were, like, oh, 100%. that up, you know, a little bit better. But th- th- these days, it's the, the field is so saturated with people that, I don't like it's just unreliable. You, you try to become an adjunct, you'll be adjuncting for 15 years before anything happens, unless you somehow break through with your poems, uh, or a story or whatever. But um or you crazy. just meet the right meet the right dean or something, you know, and you oh, right. 
of course there's the but, networkers too that we all we all saw and yeah. I, I admired them in a way because i was like dude i don't know how you're so good at this but it's kind of amazing like they have two books out and they're just in their middle of their phd <laughs> i'm like holy crap david greenspan was somebody else i mean really couldn't write but uh got a book out you know um I mean, there's That's, just people that yeah. that are there's people that are good at an aspect of writing or teaching or whatever that's not necessarily the thing itself you know um yeah and there's some people that are just good at all like the rock but uh but i mean you have to understand like to be that talented in that many things and to be able to have the kind of mindset where you can just do the thing continually you know teach seven classes you know, and not go insane. I mean, I taught four, and dude, you you just don't sleep. You're yeah. just always you're always grading. You're always answering people students' emails. Students are always wanting to know why this, why that, why this, why that. Yeah, and that's the thing. You like know? four is like kind of like your max, but usually if you're, I think they'll give you five. They used to give me five at the max, and still call it part time. By the way, um, really. And, Oh yeah, I didn't get any. FAU, benefit. I didn't get four, any four benefits full time. Yeah, well, maybe I mean FAU is better. They pay better too. So <laughs> yeah. Um. So yeah, that's like your max, and then you're doing, and if you're doing five, then you're really fucking. You're overloaded, and you you might be making just enough to get by. That's the other thing. So, and then the next semester, one class. Yep. Anyway, we're or getting like out. me right now, zero glasses. <laughs> or yeah, like well, you, yeah, you're like at the end in a summer like lull, and if they, you know, if you're lucky enough to get something in summer, that'd be uh, a miracle because you'd be lucky enough to get anything in the fall when there's a bunch of classes out there. Uh, yeah. I don't know, man. Let, we're getting a little off topic with this teaching. I mean, they, they these things just have to, they have to get off topic, you know. Um, it's, it's just. But yeah, the story is kind of bullfighting is a, a different world, but uh, it is it's about passion, about what you do with your life. Uh, my my point, yeah, my point being simply, everybody wonders, and it's almost like a midlife crisis. And this guy probably isn't even in his forties, but you know, and me and you definitely aren't. But <clears throat> everybody wonders, like, did I go the right route? Should I just have done this? Should I just just have done that? And there's like a lot of doubts in yeah. the human, like in in the lifespan of a of a man, especially, you know, um, picking a career. Um, and when your career is bullfighting, I mean, <laughs> by the way, do you ever watch any bullfighting? No, I haven't. Oh, it's not man. really a, a a subject of interest for me, so I was surprised that, that I like this story so much. Honestly, dude, you should go on and watch like a five minute bullfight. It's um, got to be brutal. It's it is almost inhuman to watch. The bull to me reminds me so much of Moo, dude. The the damn thing just moves and acts and fucking things. bowling ball. Yeah, with horns. And so they were calling um, what some of the guys, so the gypsy, he had, a, I forget the Spanish name, but it's essentially called a harpoon. It's this thin blade, uh, the picador also, is, yeah, I believe it's the name yeah, um, But it's, it's, it's called, uh, this, the literal translation means harpoon. Right. Um, and it looks like a harpoon. I looked it up just so I could yeah. uh, know what it was. And I saw, of course, I saw the pictures of them sticking out of the right. like shoulder. So they'll they'll put in as many as they can. Um, and sometimes that's like part of the spectacle. How many how many harpoons can we put into the bowl yeah. and still have it charging and running around? They don't kill the bull until the fight is, is basically out of it. This story, by the way, the second plot point, the it's thing that ban- really... It's Bander, uh, Banderillos, Banderillos or something? Banderillos, yeah. Yeah. 
the second plot point, as the rock would call it, is when he can't get the sword. <laughs> <laughs> right. It, it's it funny. Keeps ending. <laughs> right. It's funny because yeah. there's something like dreamlike about it, you know. Right, right. It's like Boyd um, kind of remind me of that scene in um corrections when uh Chip's at the grocery store and he meets his boss. I forget what exactly what the situation was, but like he's stealing, he's stealing a piece yeah. of meat. Yeah. It's like in his shorts and it's sliding down his leg. It's just like this nightmare that he that will not end. And it's yes. yeah. So the sword keeps bending like it's made out of, I don't know, like uh uh you know, uh, tin like or something. Noodle. Yeah. Yeah. Like it, it does that three times. <laughs> and he's just straining out over his knee and like, I got this. And it's and the, the the young, beautiful matador is saying, Hey, maybe it's just all bone, you know? Keep at it, buddy. <laughs> yeah. Just kind of la- like almost laughing, but he, he's obviously not cruel. But all right. How much time you got? Um we got like 15 minutes. Um uh, 20 minutes. Yeah. She's gonna with a dog um so that's the second plot point is when things start to go wrong um it's right, he's just getting his then. ass kicked at that point yeah. yeah i mean after he after he uh <laughs> he starts getting frustrated and what he eventually does is he stabs a bull uh he gourds it um all right, so before we even get into that, let me explain a little bit about bullfighting. Because I, I've studied it a little bit more because I've read so much Hemingway. So yeah. hey. All right. Sorry I'm, about I, that. Uh, it's not <laughs> your fault. It's Zoom. Um I, I Zoom. started recording. I guess it's gonna work. I don't know. I think it's is I guess there's an arbitrary cutoff at 40 minutes, um, uh, but I okay. it, apparently all that everything that we talked about is still saved. So we'll see. I'll I'll Good. check after the fact though. But um, you were just talking about um bullfighting. Get, you're getting into it because you did some right. research. So the matador, um, swings the cape in such a way that the bull. Uh, gets closer and closer to them. It, um, it's it's the same reason you watch a movie. You live vicariously through the tension that's being built. There's almost a kind of dance that's supposed to happen. It's a grotesque and disgusting dance, but the audience members with a really good matador will feel like they're in the ring themselves. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, the empathy um, thing, like especially if you're there live, you're just thinking about what it's like to be that person and being so close to, you know, death or being a just horrible, maimed. horrible, maiming, um, uh, painful death. Yeah, or both. Um, and he's supposed to do it with empathy for the bull, as stupid as that sounds, with respect for the bull. The bigger the bull, the more meat for the poor. Is that right. What? Manuel said. Um, well, for the for the bull as well, you know, they're supposed to do it with respect for the bull, and Hemingway kind of wrote it like that as well. With the um, it was a good bull. He kept saying over and over again. Kind of reminded me of the fish in Old Man in the Sea. <laughs> well, Hemingway. I mean, that's the other thing about it is Hemingway loved nature. There is, I'm speaking. Just from somebody who's read these people, I'm not actually a hunter, but I do think there is a kind of respect. Um, oh yeah, I live in North place. Carolina, man. I've talked to a guy who hunts, and he's like, he seems like he would just be kind of like a redneck, kind of whatever kind of guy that just goes out and kills things. But he has the utmost respect for the things he kills, and he looks down on people that don't. So there, are, you know, I think it kind of comes to the territory yeah, if think you about really it like that. about what you're doing. Right, think about it like this. They eat the whole animal. Um and, and bull fighting. Well, just or hunters. Just hunting. In general, right. You know, they eat the fish. Or they know like if they sell the fish, you're usually selling it to somebody you know. Um so like we eat our food from strangers. <laughs> we don't know anything about the animal. We don't yeah. know anything about the person who killed the animal. We don't know anything about the people who 
package the animal. Everything is so re far removed from the way of life down here that you lose respect for nature in a, in a, in a way, I think. And one of the Hemingway's arguments is that, you know, these guys who go out there and risk their lives to do this do have respect for these animals. And I think what turned the audience against Manuel wasn't the fact that he couldn't entrance them, although he couldn't. The, the crowd was not cheering for him. Nope. When he was doing what he was doing, he couldn't, whatever spell it is that a matador is supposed to cast, he could not cast. Right. Um, right before everything hit the fan, he did one like good, somewhat good move, but it was pure risk. And he got like a paltry applause, I think. Right. After that. And, and um, then it started, uh, everything just started to go to shit. Um. What's funny is while he was trying to pick the, the bowl, the sword bent so much that it flew out into the audience. And they <laughs> threw that back at him too when they're throwing their cushions. <laughs> yeah. Throwing their uh, the critic was throwing his um champagne bottle. Right. There's, a, all, there's another element of humor in Hemingway's writing, like even while all this grotesqueness is going on. You know, let me just talk about how funny it is. You know, it's to absurd, yeah, to be a to be a laughing stock at the thing you love most in the world. Which, by the way, that's you know, once again, the ultimate failure. I think that was the big theme in Hemingway's life. It's just ultimate, complete, and total failure. Um, in his life, at, what do you mean? At, well, just the short, happy life of Francis McComber. Um, <laughs> right, guy's a failure. You know, so like among like, his oh. characters, and like he was kind of obsessed with that. It's probably what made him such a good fucking writer. He was obsessed with failure. He was like white elephants, you know. Um, yep. He fails at convincing his wife. He fails even at keeping his marriage or keeping the relationship alive, whatever it was. Um, yeah. The sun also rises. The narrator fails to win over. Um, Brett. Well, I mean, wins yep. are over at the end, but he doesn't want her anymore. <laughs> he right. He's her. he's grown so much. He's, he sees her for what she is. And um, ironically, this story is called The Undefeated. <laughs> and, and, and I mean, he's been he's been defeated throughout his life. <laughs> yeah. <You know>? <laughs> <laughs> he's been nothing but defeated. Um, I, you know, why so, that title uh, I'll, you know, I may have to read this, you know, for another five years before I understand why that title. Because mm -hmm. yeah. uh, I, for the life of me, I, I don't know. Maybe if he's talking about Cerrito, mm -hmm. I don't know if um, because it doesn't seem like it is. It seems like he picked that title for this man. Why? Yeah. You no, know, why? Why that? He does kill the bull. It's it's ironic, I, I guess. Um. I don't know. Maybe it's because he didn't feel he'd ever been defeated. Even up until the end, all he was talking about was, I was really good. I was yeah. really good, wasn't I? And, yeah, don't and Cerrito, finally, <laughs> Cerrito finally, you know, um, consents to give him that. Do you, you want to talk about did. the ending there a little bit? Yeah, I mean, um, so he kills the bull, but not before he's gored. Mm -hmm. He kills it. He um, jams the sword in so much that his hand and his elbow also go into the bowl. And right. when he pulls it out, and he looks over at the bowl. He pulls it out. He go. He goes unconscious. By the way, there's a real sexual, a lot of sexual imagery going on. <coughs> Not in the entirety of the bull fight. Um. Sword won't go in. Or finally, mm. does go in. He loses consciousness. <laughs> okay, I never thought about it <laughs> like that, but it makes sense, dude. That, that's what I was thinking the whole time when I was reading. It. Well, you're you, you know, you're crazy. <laughs> yeah, he's staring at that. So one of the horns is dull, but the other one on the bull is really sharp and really long. He's staring yeah. at it the whole time. <laughs> he's like, he, yeah, it's a uh, it's male impotence right there. <laughs> yeah. He can't get it going. Dude, it, it becomes a Dolly painting. 
I swear to God, in the middle of this story, it's like a dolly <sighs> fucking painting. You know, yeah, the sword is oh. melting in, in his fucking hand. He has to he has to stab it with his own fist, basically, <laughs> yeah. to kill the people, thing. People are throwing things at him. Everyone's telling him to go to the doctor, and he's not listening. It's like hell. It's like being in hell. Yeah. Um, and he wakes up, and he's in the surgery room. Uh, they're passing scissors around, trying to cut off um the part of his hair that denotes that he's a bullfighter. I forget what it's called, but it's it's a ponytail that's been yeah. Um, Kalita, I think is that what it is. Yeah, been pulled over his uh over his forehead so yeah i was trying oh. to figure out what to make of that because in the beginning of the story uh zarito's like if you fuck up basically what happens in the story you're done and you have to promise yeah. me that you're done so he's there looking at it while manuel's begging him not to cut it off and zarito looks down on him and it's like oh it's just kidding i was kidding and so right. like when i read it the second time i'm like oh so he's looking down at a guy who it doesn't matter whether or not he cuts his damn hair off. He's he's done regardless. Like he's dying or he's uh, irreparable anyway. Yeah. I mean, so, yeah. That was the read I got from it. Why tell him that he was great if he wasn't going to die? You know? Um, right. Why not clip it off if he wasn't going to die? Uh, I think that's the conclusion that they came to. Um. Which again would be fitting for a Hemingway story. The narrator dies, <laughs> right? And he kind of yeah. like the narrator is in it, like just in Manuel's head at that that point. He's like, "To hell with this operating table." He'd been on plenty before. He was not going to die. There was no. There would be a priest if he was going to die. So it's like him right. reasoning why he's, you know, he's going to live. <laughs> basically, um. It's written such a weird way because it's like it'll detach from Manuel, but it will get so close to what he's thinking, especially in that scene you're just talking yeah, about where he's trying to stick uh, the sword in. It's full omniscience, which means that it can go into anybody's head at any time. And he does while the fight is happening. He's going into all sorts of people's heads. Yeah. Um, it's almost like anyways, almost like circling the, the stadium. But it eventually it knew it anyway knew, you know, that whatever this guy was feeling at that time was going to move the reader. And so I gotta stay here. Mm-hmm. Um and yeah, that you know, I think that that was the denouement was uh that they realized it doesn't matter if he quits anymore. It doesn't matter if he cut his ponytail off anymore. It's, you know, this is his last fight, whether he likes it or not. Right. <laughs> and and the guy went down swinging. You know, the guy went down. <coughs> this is all I loved, and I was good at it for a time. And and that's it. And that's this is my purpose on earth. Um. Anyway, so very uplifting story, man. <laughs> not a love him. <laughs> you're not gonna. You're not gonna read anything by Hemingway that's just gonna be, or really by any of our favorite writers. You know, I don't read anything. I don't like read stuff by Sharon Olds and feel super uplifted about life <laughs> yeah. or about people in life per se. I just I feel uplifted in that somebody wrote this. You know, and that it's, it's it is possible to do. But I, true. I, I think I the way that Leon Lee writes about love is I don't know if I'd use the term uplifting, but he's definitely he can be transcended. He can like you know make you feel yeah. hope, <laughs> you know. But even old, even Leon anyway, Lee was like think about <laughs> old man in the sea. The way you felt what way I felt when I re- read that, it was it was transcendent. It was like beautiful beauty triumphs overall, no matter how shitty things are. That's all that matters, you know, love and beauty. That's kind of what Hemingway was all about when he's at his best. It would be um, interesting to see when he wrote because those those two are kind of like the antithesis of each other. You know, here's this guy, everybody's telling him to stop fishing, just give up. And he goes yeah. out and he catches the biggest fucking fish they ever saw. Yeah. Um 
he's not able you know he's not able to bring the whole thing back that they I mean, he still kind of hard. fails at the end of the day like because the fish sort of like that but he also sort of triumphs you know in that he proves to everybody i can you know i caught this fucking giant thing nobody none of you could have caught it i caught it <coughs> right you know so he comes back kind of a hero to the town yeah. now and manuel is not a hero you know manuel is the uh, flip side to that what if everybody's right <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's a bit horrifying <laughs> what if everybody is right you know uh so two great stories by the way to think about what if everybody's wrong about something and, I, and only i could prove them wrong then you got the what if everybody's right and I'm going to prove them all right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Even though I believe the opposite. Yeah. And you're the, you, you don't know. You know, you're convicted. Uh, you, you know, you're convinced of it, but uh, you don't really know how it's going to turn out. <laughs> you're just stuck in the story. Anyways, man, I got to go. <laughs> all right. Well, it's good talking to you about this. Um, I'll, what I'll do is I'll, I'll kind of connect these two things together i'll just put them in a folder so you can at least look at them if you ever want to and the uh yeah. The wheel. <laughs> yeah and uh i don't I mean i don't know we'll see but um i don't know if we'll ever listen to this again <laughs> <laughs> well listen man i'd like to you, you said like a lot of great things i think you i mean you obviously you know could talk about hemingway all freaking day so i would like to keep doing this you know you pick a short story i pick a short story yeah it yeah i'd like me... to ideas for how to teach this oh. stuff you know um, yeah I, I just need to get back into like reading short stories and fiction in general like i want i do want to read sabbath theater but dude that's a motherfucker man i fall off so easily with it even though it like when i you know when i'm when i was reading it i was like damn this is so fucking good but it's like it's daunting in a way too for me because i'm kind of stupid but uh yeah you have to get past <laughs> the first 200 pages and after well, that that's a huge ask man he's, he's basically writing like dostoevsky as a you know a jew from new york in 1985 yes. or something you yes. know like it's it's so that's oh it always reminded me of like a russian novel and how it's written i mean even the one of the main characters is russian so, or um whatever she's from uh she's from uh, croatia Russia, but, uh, yeah, this is Ukraine essentially. Yeah, um, but, uh, but yeah, I would I would like to eventually get to that, but I want to. Um, I'll just let you know like how it goes. But uh, yeah, let's just do stick with short stories. So, like I said, it's good for me too because I need to like I just need to connect more with literature. So That's you pick one. We'll do it to. again, man. Okay. All right, buddy. All right, man. I'll talk to you later. All right, man. Love you. Peace. Right, love you too, dude. Bye. <laughs>